got a troubled mind Wash it out and hang it up on a clothing line And the sun will shine All the worries gonna leave my troubled mind I've got a broken thing Hey everybody, welcome back to the program. Today I'm talking with Stefan Kinsella. Stefan is a legal scholar and a former patent attorney, and he wrote a book a few years ago called Against Intellectual Property, and he actually believes that uh, patents on pharmaceutical drugs and even genes from companies like Monsanto uh, causes a real big problem and actually stifles scientific innovation. So today, Stefan and I talk a little bit about his book and and some of the issues related to uh, patents and copyrights and science. Thanks so much for listening. Stick around. Stefan Kinsella, thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. So uh, most of my audience probably isn't familiar with your work. So give people a little bit of background on on what you do, what your expertise is, and then just a brief introduction to to your book, Against Intellectual Property. Sure. Um, I'm a patent attorney and intellectual property attorney. I've been doing this for 20 plus years. Um, and um, have a technical background, so most of my work I do high-tech laser-type patents and things like that. So I've had a, a lot of experience with the intellectual property field, copyrights, trademarks, uh, and mostly patents over the last 20-plus years. I am also um, have been interested in Austrian economics and free market economics and libertarian free market-type theory for about the same amount of time. And so uh, my interest sort of dovetailed on this, and uh, as a patent attorney and as an attorney and as a libertarian, you know, naturally the topic of intellectual property rights arose in my mind as to whether this is a legitimate type of law, a legitimate type of right, whether we can justify these rights um, under free market or individualist principles, right, whether whether – patent and copyright law in particular are compatible with um, a free market system and a, you know, a system of liberty and property rights that we tend to favor as Westerners and as libertarians. And, you know, the, the answers I had seen uh, or the, uh, the, uh, the arguments I had read, like from Ayn Rand and others, which were pro-patent and copyright – early in my education never satisfied me. Um, so I kind of assumed that patent and copyright were legitimate, have a place in our in our system, but that the arguments weren't quite satisfying and maybe there were better arguments. And I searched for them and searched for them and I couldn't find any. But they all seem to have problems. Um, for, for example, you know, uh, why do patents last 17 years and, co- and copyrights last 100 and 50 years, roughly. Um, why wouldn't they last forever if they're real property rights? Or, or if they're not going to last forever, why would they last those amount of years? Why not 10 years for patents instead of 17? Why not 50 years? How do we know what the right right number is? And so I, I figured, well, I'm going to be a patent lawyer and I'm a libertarian and I write on that area. So maybe I can figure it out. So I started trying to figure it out myself and I never could find a good, I kept running up against the wall. You know, I, every, every argument I came up with failed, failed, failed. And then I finally realized the reason I was having trouble justifying this was because it's actually completely (laughs) contrary to property rights. And I was trying to justify something that can't be justified. I was trying to justify the unjustifiable. So I came to the conclusion over 20 years ago that patent and copyright law um, are complete aberrations um, and complete um, um, abominations, you could say. They are – they do nothing but harm and damage. They have no place in a free market system. Um, they violate property rights. They reduce competition, and they limit free speech and freedom on the internet. Um, They're very dangerous. They reduce innovation. They've harmed the human race greatly, I believe, by slowing down innovation and the wealth that would have come along with technological developments that patent law has stifled. 
So I'm a complete opponent of patent and copyright law, even though I practiced it for uh, in my legal career for the last 20 plus years. Well, let's get into some of, of the details. So you said there's a lot of harm caused by, by these kinds of laws. And I've had a number of experts on the show who work in agriculture and biotechnology. And despite, uh, you know, having no problem with, with a market system uh, or, or even biotechnology in general, uh, they're very skeptical of companies like my, uh, like Monsanto uh, patenting the, the plants that they develop or, or um, you know, if they discover a gene that they can put into a plant that makes it desist, uh, resistant to disease. Uh, right. They're very, very skeptical of, of the results of that. So is there a history, just more broadly, is there a history of big companies using um, copyright laws and patent laws to, to keep competition out of the market and try to control the space that they're in? Well, absolutely. Um, and look, I'm a libertarian. I'm a capitalist. I'm a free market advocate. I don't have a problem with corporations or other forms of business organization or with large companies. Um, whatever emerges on the free market is fine. Uh, but you do tend to find that the larger, more established, entrenched industries and larger firms, they tend to take advantage of whatever laws are available, and they tend to lobby for the extension of the laws that, that benefit them. So, you know, just like Walmart is in favor of increasing the minimum wage – because they already pay above the minimum wage, and the minimum wage doesn't hurt them if it gets raised. It hurts their competitors who, who are trying to compete with them. You know, So everyone thinks that the minimum wage is for the little guy, but really you have large companies in favor of it. And you have lots of examples. Uh, Gabriel Kalko, Murray Rothbard have written about this. Um, <clears throat> you'll, you'll hear the mythologies put out there that uh, patent and copyright are for the little guy, right? the small inventor or the sole artist. And these are just um, uh, the result of propaganda spread by people who have an entrenched interest in the copyright and patent industries, which would either be the government agencies that promote it and, you know, they have the copyright copyright and the, um, the patent offices, um, or the companies that depend upon this, which would be, in the case of copyright, the publishing industries themselves. Right and uh, the producers and the studios themselves, rather than the individual artists, um, who in most cases don't benefit that much at all. But they're just you know stuck into this system where you have to have a publisher, and you have to sell all your rights to your books and things like that. Thankfully, that's changing in recent decades with technology, which is helping to finally overcome some of the strangling effects of this. Um, and in the field of patents, you, what you have is you have larger companies that will acquire massive war chests of patents because they can afford to do so because they're the entrenched, you know, incumbents already in an area. And they would, and then so they use their early advantage and their large, their early large size to fund the acquisition of these patent monopolies, which they can use to stop competition. And it helps entrench their monopolistic position, and it leads to sort of a cartel-like system or oligopoly system. So, for example, in the smartphone industry, you have some a few major smartphone makers, you know, Samsung and Apple and people like that, and they'll fight each other using their patent war chests, and they'll each spend millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on patent attorneys like me defending fighting each other in court, and then they'll finally make a settlement. Um, you know, they can afford to defend, they can afford to sue. It's millions of dollars to, to file these lawsuits and to defend them. And then they, they make a settlement, and they one agrees to pay the other royalty or whatever, and then the price is passed on to the consumer. And then the companies can sit back on their laurels, and they don't have to innovate as much because they're protected from competition from each other, and they can pass the prices on to their customers, and their customers can't go to any alternative suppliers because there's only a few. And there's only a few because the small entrants, the upstarts, the individual inventors, the very small companies, don't have the resources and the patent war chest to enter the field and fight with these big guys. If they entered into a patent battle with Apple or Samsung, they would be obliterated because they wouldn't have any patents of their own to fight back with. You know, it'd be like America and Russia can threaten each other with nuclear destruction, but 
smaller countries, uh, they don't have that, that, that counter threat. Um, so patents have led to uh, larger, larger companies and entrenched interest and slow down innovation because companies don't have to innovate as much. They can rely upon the patents, which protect them from competition. This is the thing that people don't understand because this is not the propaganda that is spread about patents. The idea is that the propaganda is that, you know, the guy in his garage that comes up with a new idea should be able to, um, to, um, to, to make a good profit off of it. Or, or, or a large company, a pharmaceutical company, uh, or a gene company that spends lots of money developing some new technique or some new drug or identifying some new gene sequence. Uh, they need to recoup their investment, and therefore the patents help them do that. All that means is that the patent protects you from competition in the free market for a longer period of time than you would be protected by your natural first mover advantage or your reputation uh, or whatever. So basically, it's basically uh, reducing competition, protecting you from competition. So it's clearly protectionist, which is the opposite of the free market and competition. There's a, and this is the reason I wanted to talk to you is because even though you as a libertarian or, or sometimes outside of the you know, the quote-unquote mainstream view, your arguments are really similar to uh, arguments I'm hearing from from experts in, in, in biotechnology, so people that are also concerned about this. And one of the points that stuck out to me, and I'll link to this so people can read it, but this is, a, a, I believe he's a patent attorney as well, but he says that by letting people uh, patent genes that they that they discover or they figure out a new way to, to use the, the information uh, to fight a disease, they're just they just end up patenting whatever they discover. And so instead of yes. having multiple people compete to produce the end product that everybody wants, like a cancer treatment, you just have thousands and thousands of individual patents on things. And so no one is really doing the the kind of work where you check each other's work and you build on what the last person yes. did. And so we're not getting the innovation. So comment a little bit on that. As far as you know, I know you're not a, a biologist, but well, I think that um, every proponent of the patent system claims that the patent system is, is a good thing and is necessary because it gives a so-called incentive to people to innovate because it protects their innovation from competition for a certain number of years. So it allows you to basically charge a monopoly price for a time on your product. Um, so they believe that it has an effect, right? And, um, but if it has an effect, that means that it has a distorting effect or a skewing effect, which is well well recognized by economists that when you have a patent system introduced, it's going to distort the market for the types of things that people devote their R&D dollars towards. You're going to tend to push your R&D dollars towards things you can get a patent on instead of things that you can't. So abstract, more abstract techniques um, that cannot be patented um, w- we tend to get less funding, and the things that can be patented get more funding. So I don't know why anyone thinks that it's a good idea for the federal government to have a system that would distort the natural landscape of where R&D dollars and you know the attention of scientists would go. So that's one thing. Um, the patent system is a distraction for most engineers and scientists that I deal with because you know they normally – Engineers and companies are trying to solve practical uh, problems to make their products work better. Uh, they're not doing it for a patent reward. Uh, the companies aren't doing it for a patent reward. I don't think the patent system does actually incentivize innovation. It's just that when you come up with the inevitable discoveries and innovations that make sense in this industry, you're going to file a patent for it once you've done the work for it, because you can use that patent either defensively or offensively like a patent troll later on. Um, So the patent system simply is a distraction for these engineers who then have to meet with lawyers and give them explanations of of, of their inventions, and they have to think of them in certain ways. Um, The patent system is basically an artificial legislated scheme full of concepts that do not map to the natural common law property rights system that we are all used to, that evolved naturally, right? Like we have property rights in land and cars and our bodies and, and we have contractual rights, but the patent system say, 
defines a, a property right in an invention. And an invention is some useful technique or design of an apparatus or a machine that can be described in words by a patent lawyer who's sort of a cross between a technical expert and a legal expert, and that is new and useful, right, and non-obvious. So these are all kind of fuzzy terms. So what you have is you have these these engineers, you know, interfacing with, with the lawyers and getting basically monopoly protection sometimes on some of the things they come up with. Um, and then this leads to this this uh, this arbitrary distinction between discovery and invention, which really there's no clear cut distinction between them because in the field of science and technology, in a sense, you could say that all all things that function and work, right, all ways of doing things that function and work in in a certain efficient way that's different or better than what's gone in the past, is a discovery. If you discover that you can use if, if you discover that you can use a certain material uh, with, a, with a given property that's better than something that was used in the past, that's a discovery. Is it an invention? Who knows? And the patent examiners don't know, and the judges don't know, and the juries don't know. So it all becomes a word game controlled by the lawyers and the large corporations. One uh, one kind of a devil's advocate kind of a question, I suppose, is that uh, it really is expensive to develop new medical treatments and new medicines, and legitimately so. I mean, to to get through FDA clinical trials, big big drug companies, for example, have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars and maybe a decade or more uh, just so they can get permission to sell their medicine. So is is there a legitimate way, in your view, to protect that investment without putting restrictions on everyone else that might be in that market? Well, I think that we have to step back and, and think about this. It's not the function of the law or the function of the government to make it easier for people to come up with business models that work, right? Which is what which is what we're getting at when people say, I need to recoup my investment. I mean, every business needs to recoup their investment. Every business faces competition if they're successful. Um, there's, of course, a desire of every company to not have competition or to stay ahead of competition if possible. And that's fine. And that's part of the free market process. But the way the free market works is you come up with an idea of how to solve consumer desires. You put some resources into it. You make a forecast about the future. You make a judgment with your property. You make a gamble. You make a bet. You put your money where your mouth is and you, you try to make a profit with a future plan, right? And you put your money your money towards it. And you know that if you're successful, you come up with a new idea that satisfies consumers, that's going to be usually visible to the public in some kind of way. It's going to send a signal, a price signal or some other kind of signal to the market, hey, what I'm doing works. What I'm doing satisfies consumers. You know, when someone starts selling Model T Fords uh, or they start selling uh, Coca-Cola, or anything, or movie, you know, they start showing movies to, to citizens, and they start making a profit. The profit is an aberration, right, from the standard um, returns on the market. That It's usually temporary, because the profit signal, the fact that you're making a profit is broadcast to people. And people say, hey, uh, this guy's selling uh, hamburgers to people, McDonald's. Let's form a Burger King. Now, McDonald's might not like having the competition of Burger King. Coca-Cola might not like having the competition of Pepsi. Ford might not like having the competition of General Motors, right? But And they don't give away all of their secrets if they can avoid it, but they have to give away some of their secrets, you know? To sell a hamburger, everyone knows that you have some kind of company. You have employees. You have a factory. You have a chain of product distribution, you, ha- you have a way of doing it, and other people will emulate more or less that model, and they'll make some changes trying to outdo you. That's how competition works on the free market. That's how society advances. So when you have companies that say, you know, we have to expend dollars to research, to, to, to discover new genes, or to uh, come up with pharmaceutical products, it is true that these things cost something. And it is true that some products are easier for others to emulate and copy than others. 
digital information like CDs and records are easy to copy now. Um, other things are hard to copy, like a hamburger restaurant might be hard to emulate. Um, but you have to also understand that one reason the costs are so high for some of these endeavors, like pharmaceuticals, the costs are so high because of another federal government agency, the, the FDA, right, which imposes extreme delays and regulations and costs on companies that raises their costs. And so you have these companies come screaming and complaining about the high cost imposed on them by the federal government. And the solution is for the federal government to add another regulatory thing called a patent agency, which is going to give them a temporary monopoly to allow them to recoup some of the costs that were artificially inflated by the federal government in the first place. It might be a better solution to abolish the FDA to lower the cost directly and to abolish other regulations and taxes, right, which would lower the costs on these companies. And then you wouldn't have to give them a temporary monopoly because they wouldn't have any cost like that to recoup in the first place. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point. And, and I think it goes to the issue of people not seeing the contradictions in their point of views. So, uh, for example, people on, on the left who who – typically don't like big corporations they will they'll criticize patents as you know this this problem that's caused by capitalism right this is the market these are property rights uh, but right. then, they, th- then they don't see the relationship to restrictions from the fda so uh, like we just talked about it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to get a new drug on the market and then in that case they go oh well, we just need we need price controls or we need the fda to speed up their process they need a bigger budget and so they don't see the connection between these two things. Can you comment a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I'm, one of the arguments given for the patent system is that without a patent system, companies would resort more to what they used to do, which was they would keep things secret. That's called trade secret. Um, they would try to keep things secret as much as possible, um, which – they think is a bad thing that you should publish everything, which I don't. I don't believe is true. I think that there's a there's a there's always a balance between how much information any given company wants to keep proprietary and is able to keep proprietary. A lot of things, especially nowadays, are not you're not able to keep things secret. Uh, a lot of things that are supposedly secret, like uh, you know the Kentucky Fried Chicken's herbs and spices and the recipe for Coca Cola. I don't think those things are even actually secret. I think they're known. It's just it's just they're they're said to be secret, you know. The, the the point is, you can't keep a lot of things secret for a long time. Eventually, they'll leak out. Um. So, uh, the, the problem with the left is, and the right, to be honest, both the left and the right have made a mistake. The left and the right both accept the false idea that property rights and capitalism include patent and copyright rights, and because they accept this false premise. The right is in favor of patent and copyrights, and the left is opposed to patent and copyrights because they believe it's capitalistic. But they're both actually wrong. The essence of socialism, you know, the typical example of socialism is centralized state control of the means of production. But the essence of it is basically an institutional system which erodes and intervenes with and interferes with private property rights understood as property rights assigned basically according to the the simple common law principles of whoever got the thing first, right, that's Lockean homesteading, or whoever contractually assigned it as an owner to someone else. That's how you determine ownership, by contract and by first use. Okay, those are the basic hallmarks of of the private property system. Anything else that deviates from that is basically socialistic if it's done by a state or institutionalized. And patent and copyright do that because what they do is a right is given to some, some, someone by the state, some favorite of the state, someone who applies for a patent or someone who gets a copyright. The state gives that guy a certificate basically which says, we give you a certificate that you can use. You can come to our courts, which we have a monopoly on the use of violence and force in the legal system. You can come to our courts and present the certificate, and you can use that certificate to shut down 
your competitor's factory. That's basically what patent and copyright do. I call this a negative servitude. I think that's the best way to classify in the law. A negative easement or a negative servitude is similar to what you have in a restrictive covenant when you have neighbors who agree voluntarily that no one in a neighborhood can you know, paint their house purple or something like that. They, it's a negative right. It's, it's, how you, it's, it's a right of your neighbor to stop you from using your property in a certain way, which is legitimate if it's voluntarily agreed to, which it is, like in a restrictive covenant, um, in, in a homeowners association, for example. But when the government just grants this to one of your competitors and gives your competitor the right to stop you from making something competing with them, it basically gives him control over your property rights. It basically gives your competitor a property right in your factory, right? Because he can, he can say, I can stop you from using your factory to make this kind of iPhone or this kind of widget or this kind of smartphone or this kind of book. So the ultimate problem with patent and copyrights is that they restrict property rights. They, they take away property rights. And so basically, patent and copyright are socialistic, and that's the problem with them. So socialists, if they had any consistency, they would, they would actually not be so against patent and copyrights. It is true that patent and copyrights are used to artificially increase the size and power of large corporations, but a lot of socialistic policies do, like the minimum wage and others. Uh, trade, uh, uh, lots of regulations that large companies can afford to handle, which put smaller companies um, at a disadvantage. Um, so the socialists are just, the leftists are just confused. Um, we, we need to have a vibrant, competitive, pro-innovation realm, and the government needs to set the ground rules of property rights and stay out of it. It is not the government's job. It's not the job of the law to make it easier for someone with a new business idea, no matter what it is, to recoup their costs or to to avoid competition. Um, if you think about it, it's, it's almost like the mainstream people that are in favor of IP law. They like a free market. They like competition within bounds of reason. They don't like too much competition. Um, if, if you have competition that faces you after you have a, a, a successful product or or, or service, it's okay to have competition gradually arise, and then you can adapt and compete with your competitors. But if it's too easy to compete with you, they think that should be illegal, which they think is the case for basically goods that can be easily replicated, where, where a main ingredient of the success of a good is the information in it, right? Like the composition of a pharmaceutical or the uh, a, a digital, the digital version of a movie or of a uh, of software or of a song, right? Which can be easily copied. And the the fact that our digital age makes it easy to copy simply means that it's easier to to compete. So what this means is the free market is working better. There's more competition right away, and these people don't like that because it's too easy to compete. They say they say, well, how in the world can I start a new venture if someone can compete with me as soon as I start uh, making money. And by the way, back on the pharmaceuticals issue, the FDA requires companies as part of the FDA process to reveal um, the details of their of their drugs. And because the process takes years and because these, these results have to be made public, by the time the company gets FDA approval and they're about to sell their brand new drug, all their, all their would-be competitors already know what the ingredients are and everything because the FDA has forced them to drop their panties and reveal their goodies, right? <laughs> so they don't have the natural advantage that you would have in a free market of keeping some things proprietary for a while and having a good first-mover advantage. Uh, you know, maybe I come up with a new heart attack drug or a new cholesterol drug. And I get it vetted by some private uh, vetting agencies, but I don't have to reveal all my details to the world. And by the time I hit the market, you know, five years later, maybe people start finally competing, but I have a good first mover advantage. The FDA removes that, and therefore the companies squeal and scream and say, well, well, then we have to have patents because otherwise people can compete with me so easily. Well, one, one reason they can compete so easily with you is because the FDA has forced you to reveal um, the secret sauce already. 
So a lot of these problems is the result of what, what Mises, the great Austrian economist, you know, he said that the problem with regulations and controls is that controls breed controls. Because one control has unintended consequences, and it's going to have bad consequences. And so then the, the regulators and the legislators rush in to fix that with another regulation. You have another regulation, and it's a never-ending series of trying to fix the problem, which is what you always get when you try to interfere with the natural order of the free market. The best thing to do would be to respect the natural order of the free market, respect private property rights, let people compete, let some ventures succeed, some fail, and let technology just proceed on its own pace, whatever that is. What, one thing, and I'm glad you, you went into that explanation to give people some background, but you see these contradictions all over the place. So, for example, Monsanto is trying to merge with Bayer right now, and they're going to become this big conglomerate in the biotech space. And people are freaking out about that because it reduces competition, supposedly. But then they don't see it on the other end all the issues you were just describing with patent law. I mean, you have the same result that you're so afraid of, so you won't let yeah. these two companies voluntarily do this. Meanwhile, on the other side, you're going to say, no, we have to protect property rights, and, and you know, we can't have people just copying medicine and so forth. Right. So it's it's good to step back like you just did and kind of take a, a holistic view. And people don't do that because they're so, you know, so dedicated to, you know, whatever idea they have. Well, and I think most normal, decent people uh, are focusing on their own things, and they don't have time to become an expert in political theory and economics, and, you know, they're going to tend to hear the propaganda spread by the people that have uh, a lot to, to gain from these things. But uh, on the field of monopolies, yeah, the entire uh, justification for lots of government programs, like the antitrust, you know, the FTC and the antitrust laws, is this sphere of private monopoly somehow emerging, okay? Um, which has always been a schizophrenic thing, I believe, because number one, the federal government has a monopoly. It is a monopoly. It's the biggest monopoly. The government is the only source of true monopolies. So you want to empower the world's biggest monopoly to stop private monopolies from emerging, okay? But then it it helps to encourage private monopolies that wouldn't otherwise be able to exist and larger corporations that then would probably exist in a free market by making the regulations so onerous that only the large companies can afford to negotiate them, right, and to navigate them. And then by granting private monopolies called the patent and the copyright system. <laughs> the, I mean, the patent system traces its origins to a a statute in England from 1623 called the Statute of Monopolies. <laughs> There's the, the government is handing out monopolies to people with one agency, the Patent Office, while it has another agency, the FTC, designed to stop monopolies, which it helps to encourage happen in the first place. In fact, it's so schizophrenic that there's a doctrine in the courts and among these agencies where – they say that, look, we know that we're granting companies an extra market, which means a monopoly position, right, with these monopoly privileges, patent and copyright law. Um, so they have a right to charge a monopoly price. In fact, we're trying to encourage them to innovate by giving them this monopoly price to recoup the cost we've imposed on them with the FDA, which is another government agency, right? Um, but they can't, they can't abuse it. In other words, so we have to have a balance. So the judge in a federal court is going to be the one who's going to do the balance to decide whether you've abused the monopoly we gave you. So we give you a monopoly, the patent, you're charging a high price, and but then you're using it a little bit too successfully or a little bit too aggressively. Now you might run afoul of the, of the Sherman Antitrust Act or other antitrust laws. Um, so you have to have a balance between anti-monopoly and pro-monopoly positions of the same federal government. So the whole thing is schizophrenic, and the, the federal government has been done nothing but to corrupt and distort the... Um, and we haven't even talked about copyright too much. Copyright uh, is also another area where the copyright law heavily distorts culture, uh, 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 chills free speech, and threatens freedom on the Internet. 
I believe the patent system does the most damage in a tangible sense. I think it, it slows down the course of human progress and is a huge tragedy. There are millions of lives that could have been improved or saved with a technology level we would have now if the patent system had not existed for the last 200 years, or especially the last 50 or 100 years in the high-tech era. And it's, it's, the, it's, it's like Bastiat says, it's the seen and the unseen. We can see the benefits of a law, but we can't see the unseen costs of it, right? The things that we, we lost that we never would have seen. We might have flying cars by now. We might have colonized Mars by now. We might have cured cancer by now. Um, so to me, it's a huge tragedy. And um, we need to get people thinking that we have got to get the government out of this and let science and technology and the free market alone. Well, one way I think that this causes problems, especially in, in education and in scientific research, is you have these, these private science journals who they they publish the results of research that the government funds and then they put the content behind a payroll a paywall and they copyright it. And yeah. so if you're a consumer, if you're a science writer like me and you want to get into this information so you can write about it, well, too bad, you know, you need to pay us $35 to access the article for 10 hours or you can sign yeah. up for a $2000 a year subscription. And so you get this situation where everything is controlled by these big institutions. I mean, you have some open access journals that are popping up, which is a good a good thing. Uh, yes. but for the most part, you have the NIH and uh, these other, other federal agencies funding a lot of academic research. And then you have these big corporations, these big publishing companies that own all of the final product. And yes. so, so people don't think of that very much. Do you want to talk a little bit about that if it's not too far outside what you, what you work on? Well, no, I think that's a good example of how a lot of these government um, policies and, and programs uh, reinforce each other. So not only the FDA, right, and the, the controls that they impose and other government regulations and taxes uh, and the antitrust system, which is in conflict with the patent system, but then you have the copyright system, which has, uh, has led to an entrenched system of controls by the publishers, Right, it's almost a guild type system, like was was what we had at the beginning of the copyright system under the Statute of Anne in England in 1709, uh, which 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 came after the, the Stationers Company, which was the actual publishing guild that emerged after the advent of the printing press. Uh, so it was reformed and, and led to what we have now, which which was the, what we've had for the 20th 20th century, 20th 19th centuries. Um, so. Yes, you do have – if we didn't have copyright and – and then the other thing is government funding of research. So basically every aspect of this is intertwined and intertangled with each other. They reinforce each other. They cause problems, which gives the government more excuse to come in with yet another program to try to solve the problem that they've caused. But yes, I, I completely agree with you on that. Um, the the alleged goal of the patent system, by the way, is not to incentivize innovation. It is to encourage disclosure of things that would otherwise be um, kept secret. That's what the patent bargain is. If you read the, the Patent Act, it's basically if you disclose in a, in a patent application, you disclose the details of this invention, we will give you a temporary monopoly over it. So that's the bargain. They're trying to encourage disclosure. And yet, the copyright system has has established these paywalls, right? Which wouldn't exist without copyright. These these artificial um, gated communities and uh, gatekeeper type institutions could not survive without copyright. If you remember what Aaron Swartz, the heroic internet pioneer, the the poor victim um, of copyright law, did was he he took a bunch of these. Um, scientific and, 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 and um, papers and release them, uploaded them to the world. Now, look, I, I would imagine that close to 0% of those authors were compensated for those papers. They didn't write those papers for money. They did it for their careers and because of their passion and because it was just part of what they do. But they were controlled by the publishers, right? They, they want to keep it paywalled, which is ridiculous. Why would you want to keep this amazing fund of information that we have paywalled to a, an elite group of, of, of um, uh, uh, people that have permission to read this? It should be released to everyone, especially when it's funded by our tax dollars, right? So the whole thing is, is, um, 
is, is, is a travesty, I believe. Um, what Schwartz did was he was trying to free information that would not have been able to have been paywalled without copyright and that was paid for largely by tax dollars uh, and, and are written by professors who didn't even get paid and who want their work to be read by as many people as possible. And because of that, he was threatened with decades in federal prison, so he committed suicide. It's a young man, <coughs> a bright man. You know, it's, it's a tragedy. So um, I would say copyright and patent feed on each other, and although patent law does more damage in a tangible sense, copyright law is almost more insidious because it lasts so much longer, and it distorts culture, and it reduces the information we can read. Yeah. Um, the, the, the good thing I would say, in my view, is that the advent of encryption and torrenting and the Internet and smartphones and all these ways of communicating uh, in a permissionless way um, has basically helped to kill copyright, and I think that's a good thing. And my hope is that in the future, with a certain uh, degree of technological development and advancement, 3, 3D printing will start to spell the doom for the patent system. I'd give it 30, 40 years, but you know, if you can print an iPhone in your basement with some 3D printers using a design you got by torrenting it over the Internet and no one can stop you or know that you're doing it, then patent law will be dead too. Or largely dead. So I'm hopeful that technology can save us from uh, these two horrible, horrible uh, uh, legal systems. Yeah. Well, a, a final thought, and and I th I think it's getting better in in the in the realm of publishing, for example. So these open access science journals, they make the researchers pay the the publication fee, and there are some problems with that where you have these these junk journals popping up. And they're based in India or somewhere, and they'll publish anything. But there are good ones too, and so if the if the researcher pays the fee to have this published, he or she then has an incentive to get the information out there. They're like, look, look at this article I wrote. It cost me money. I want you to read it. I want more notoriety, and so it's effectively starting to end run uh, big journals like like Science and Nature. I mean, and those are the ones that everyone wants to publish in. But over time, we're going to start getting away from it, which I'm excited to see. I think so too. I mean, I've um, I, I run an open source journal myself. It's called Libertarian Papers, but it's basically uh, zero cost. It's it's free online, and um, we don't even charge uh, the um, submission fees and things like that that the other big ones do. And I I I I looked at the the PLOS P L O S uh, journals. They look pretty good to me. It seems to me that they are taking a little bit of advantage of the defects in the in the existing system to charge the uh, the authors, but I would imagine that there's a limit to how much they can do that, because at a certain point, the researcher could, could simply publish his paper on his blog if he wanted to. It might not have the same prestige, but I think that's going to change over time. So, you know, um, you want to have peer reviews, and, and if possible, but um, I think all these changes are good, and they're shaking up the industry. I don't think that we'll see the same industry in, in, in 20 years that we see now, the way, the way that publishing is done. I think it's almost all going to be open. Most scholars and scientists that I know, they want their stuff to be open. They want to be able to link to it and send it to people and have people to be freely able to read it, even if they're not the, the world's greatest experts. Why would you restrict it to a small community artificially? So I think that's going to um, that's going to leave the day because it will never become harder to copy than it is now. The internet's just making things it's easier and easier to copy things, and once information is out there, it's out there. And um, I, I think all these trends are good, but they're going to spell the doom of of some entrenched um, business models like the the, the paywall um, journals. Yeah, well, and I hope it happens because there's there's always a way to turn a profit if you're producing content that people want. There, are, There's always a way to do it because people will pay for quality stuff. It's just you can't lock down their computers um, for too long before they get sick of it. So anyways, where can where can people find out more about your, your work, Stefan? And, and are, do you have any books coming out or any, any articles you want people to specifically know about? Yeah, I'm trying to finish up a book um, this year, uh, probably the next six months. Uh, which is a, a compilation, an edited compilation of a lot of my uh, libertarian legal theory articles called Law in a Libertarian World. 
and um, you can find out about that and also about my intellectual property related thought on stephankinsella.com. Cool. We'll, we'll link to it. And, and by the way, if anyone's curious, you can read his uh, his book on intellectual property for free. I won't charge you for it, just in case anyone's wondering. But uh, Stefan, thanks for joining me. I thought this was a great great discussion. So thank you. Yeah, and in fact, I'm I'm going to do a, a successor to that, and the title will be uh, "Copy This Book." So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's rip, coming out too. Rip off the system of a down album title. Yeah, or, or uh, yeah, well, there was an Abby Hoffman book, "Steal This Book," but he had it slightly wrong because if you copy a book, you're actually not stealing anything. So mine is just copy this book. Right. But we'll see. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks.